So, when I was 15 years old, you might find this hard to believe. When I was 15 years old, I was a local baseball hero in Canton, Ohio. Now, you're going to laugh. It's true. Before you think that I'm just arrogantly telling you a baseball story, listen to the rest of my story. So, my brother and I played baseball for about seven years. And for the first six years of our baseball career, no lie, either Bruce or I led our league, the Jackson Township Little League, in home runs every single year. As a 12-year-old, I pitched a no-hitter, had my picture in the paper, little article in the Canton Repository. Everybody thought, boy, these guys are going to make it big. As a 14-year-old, I was playing in an all-star game in the Jackson Township All-Star Game. And I got up to bat, or right before I got up to bat, there were a couple of guys on base, and our team said, hey, Brian, there's a truck just over the fence. I dare you to hit it over the fence and into the truck. As God is my witness, a la Babe Ruth, I grabbed the bat, walk up to the plate, hit the ball over the fence, and it landed in the bed of the truck. I was, a, I was a baseball hero. As a matter of fact, I think I have a picture of me. Matthew, do we have a picture of me? That's me right there as a, as a 15-year-old baseball hero in Jackson Township. And so the next year, my brother and I were moving up to the next league. So we were moving up to the, the 15 and older league. And so we had to show up for tryouts, and we showed up for tryouts. And there was about 50 or 60 boys there for tryouts. And before we ever put on a glove, one of the coaches walks up to my brother and I and says, I want you to know you guys are the very first two picks of the draft. You don't even have to try out today. Can you imagine what that did to the ego of a 15-year-old boy? All right. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, I want to be in the major leagues by the time I'm 17 or 18. I want to make millions of dollars. But something happened that year in my life. Because that year, played baseball. That year, Brian, my brother Bruce did fantastic that year. But that year, Brian transition from the home run king to the strikeout king. That, that year, I just couldn't hit a ball to save my life. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe it was my ego. Maybe I was thinking I was better than I was. And, uh, and I just couldn't hit to save my life. And, and the third game of the year, I was the very first pick in the draft. The third game of the year. Guess where I found myself? on the bench. I, I had lost my starting position. And by the way, I lost it the rest of the year. That's the last year I ever played baseball. So those are my glory days right there. Those are the, that's my glory story right there. The year would have been a waste for me if I didn't learn to do something that year that helped the team. You say, Brian, what did you learn? Well, that year I learned to bunt. And I know it sounds funny because I had always been, every time I went up, I mean, I had the coaches, you know, go for the fence, Brian, hit it as far as you possibly can. I always had the green light to do that. And, and, and this year I got up to bat and you sit back and you watch a third base coach and he's giving me all the signals and almost every time I got an opportunity to bat that year, I was told to bunt. Maybe they didn't trust my ability to... Uh, the coach is probably thinking a bunt is better than a strikeout, right? That's probably what he's thinking. And I learned to bunt well that year. As a matter of fact, the coach put me in in some difficult situations where we absolutely had to advance a runner. And a couple of times when we absolutely had to get the runner home. And I got up to the plate thinking, okay, this is my time to show them how I can hit the ball. And sure enough, he's on third base giving me the signals. And, and what's the sign? Bunt. <laughs> I was supposed to bunt. And that year, Brian Burkholder, the home run king, became Brian Burkholder, the bunt king. <laughs> that year, at least I wasn't the strikeout king. I was the bunt king. I say that for this reason, because 
in order for me to benefit the team that year, I had to learn what my role was. And if I would have never learned my role, I would have never become a functional part of the team. And I actually helped the team that year, not hitting home runs like I used to, not pitching a no-hitter like I used to, but I helped the team simply by bunting and advancing the runners. You, you see, here's my point today, and I, I want to transition. We're not talking about baseball today, but, but my point is this. In order for our team to win, we all must know our role. If we do not know our role, we cannot accomplish what God desires for us to accomplish. So, so here's what I want you to catch today. There are many believers in the body of Christ who do not understand their role as followers of Jesus Christ. They fail to realize that God has a plan for their life. And that plan involves more than just coming to church on Sunday morning. That plan involves God using them, their gifts, their talents, and their abilities, not just on Sunday, but on Monday, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Many believers fail to realize that God has a plan for their life and a desire to use them for the advancement of his kingdom. Listen, I want to I, I challenge you today with the thought, it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. It doesn't matter if you're a new believer like the 13 people that we just baptized today. God desires to use you for the advancement of his kingdom. Doesn't mean you got to be a pastor like Brian. Doesn't mean you got to be a missionary. Doesn't mean you got to be involved in full time service. As a matter of fact, the majority of God's servants are not involved in full time ministry. The majority of God's faithful servants are people just like you who go to work Monday to Friday or Tuesday to Saturday and work what we would call a secular job. And we've already blown that idea out of the water. But God uses you right where you are. Here's what I want to challenge you with today. From the very beginning, God's designed role for his followers has been clearly articulated and seen throughout Scripture. And that role has not changed. I'm afraid sometimes as we look at the Bible, we see the Old Testament and we say, okay, boy, Abraham had one responsibility and Moses had a responsibility. But when we get to the New Testament, our roles have changed. And I hope you've been able to see as we've gone through this study that your work matters, that our role has not changed. Here's the main idea that I put in your notes and I'll put up on the screen. It's this, God's purpose throughout redemptive history has always been the same. Let me say it again today. God's purpose throughout redemptive history has always been the same. So today I want to go back and do just a little bit of a review. I know this is the, the fourth message in our sermon series. And so I want you to stick with me because, because the point that we're driving home is a very important point. And today I want us to look at three passages of scripture. And in these three passages of scripture, God gives a clear and concise instruction to his followers. So the three passages that I'm talking about are in Genesis chapter 1, we'll look at it in just a moment, the cultural mandate. Matthew chapter 22, which is an incredibly convicting passage, which is the great commandment, and Matthew chapter 28, which is the great commission. We're calling these three commands GC3. That's just us. We've just kind of came up with that, all right? God's command times three. God's commission times three. I want you to catch today that these are not separate directives. 
These are not distinct instructions. Rather, they are one command, and we're passionate about this. We believe that they are one command that God has repeated throughout Scripture, at times saying them one way and at another time saying them a completely different way. But three commands that God has given to us from the very beginning that show my role and show your role in the kingdom of God. So follow along. If you have your outlines, I want you to pull your outlines out and follow along with me because I kind of want to uh, pull these three points together. And uh, it might be a little difficult today. The first point is this. We're going to go back and look at the cultural mandate. Pastor Jose talked about it just a few weeks ago. The cultural mandate has this command. Bear his image and make a difference. Let's put those verses up on the screen if we can. Genesis chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read part of verse 26 and then verses 27 and 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us, by the way, if you doubt the existence of the Trinity, right, there's a great proof of the Trinity. God says, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, jump down to verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You might sit back and say, okay, Brian, we've already studied this verse the last couple of weeks, and that's true, but, but repetition is one of our greatest teachers. And this is a truth that we really want you to comprehend because we are convinced that this is one of the great verses in Scripture that the church, the evangelical world has jumped over for years and we've missed our role. We see in this passage that God blessed man. And with that blessing, God commanded him, God commanded us to rule, to multiply, and to fill the earth. So here's the question I want you to think today. What is man supposed to fill the earth with? English teachers, I know that's not the best grammatical way to form that question. With what are we supposed to fill the earth? And so it says God blessed them and God commanded them to multiply and to fill the earth. I want you to, let me give you two thoughts, and they're not on the outline, but let me give you two thoughts. First of all, we see God's game plan in this passage. As we mentioned in last week's message, God has given us the raw materials uh, with which he desires that we take those raw materials and develop them for the benefit of the world in which we live. And we laid out this challenge, and I only repeat it for a second today, just to remind you of it, this challenge, that God has given you a garden just like Adam and Eve were given a garden where they were supposed to work and minister, God has given you a garden, and your responsibility is to tend that garden. Here's the question I'd ask you today. Are you tending the garden that God has given to you? And I'm talking specifically what you do from Monday to Friday or Monday to Saturday. That is your garden. God's game plan is for you to function in that garden. But there's a second aspect that I want you to catch. We not only see God's game plan, but we see God's glory. So, because it says that, that, that God created Adam and Eve, and he said this one. Here's what he said. I want you to reflect my image to, to the world in which, we, in which you live. And so you and I have been called to be image bearers of God. Jose alluded to that just a few weeks ago. I would remind you of the fact that this command was given pre-fall. Sin had not yet entered into the world. This is Genesis 1. The fall happened in Genesis chapter 3. Here was God's desire. God's desire was that the whole earth be filled with his glory. And his game plan for the earth to be filled with the glory of God was that those people who bore his image would go out into the world and they would reflect the image of God. 
Here's what he wanted to happen. Image bearers, producing image bearers, who in turn would produce image bearers. So much so that eventually the entire earth would be filled with individuals who realize that they bear, that they reflect the very image of God. Let me pause for a second. I don't want to get too far ahead. But does that sound a little bit like the Great Commission to you? Where we were commanded to go out and what? To make disciples. And so here in Genesis chapter 1, we've always thought that those are two completely separate, distinct commands. But we see in the very beginning, God tells us, his image bearers, I want you to reflect my image. Let, let me just apply this a couple of ways. First of all, parents, I would say this. Your number one responsibility as a mom and as a dad is to make sure that your children, you raise them up in a way that they understand the gospel, that they know Jesus, and that they reflect his image. I'm so afraid. Man, can I just be pastoral for a second and share my heart? I'm so afraid that, that, that we have so bought in to the culture of the world that what is important to the world has now become important to us. And what is important to the world has now taken precedence over what God desires for our lives. Moms and dads, God has given you beautiful children. The number one reason why God has given you children, obviously to enjoy them, and, and I trust that you're enjoying them. I know there's times when you do enjoy them, and there's times when we don't enjoy them quite as much, right? Hmm? Can I get an amen? Does anybody agree with me on that? Okay. I thought it was just my kids for a second. You, you, you were making me worried there, all right? But God has given us children for the purpose of, of helping them to become the image bearers of Jesus Christ. And, and we need to make sure that in the, in the minds of our kids that we're preaching the right message to them. Because if we're not careful, we can say one thing with our mouths, but our actions say something else. I heard one pastor, J.D. Greer, preached a great message this week in which I heard him say, pastors, or, 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 or excuse me, parents, your kids are going to be two things. Your kids are going to be, they're going to be guests someplace, and they're going to be at home somewhere else. All right, so if your kids are at home in school, on their ball teams, with their friends who don't know the Lord, and they're a guest at church. In other words, when they come in church, they're not tied in. They don't feel at home. They don't feel like, boy, this is the place where they're going to dig roots, where their friends are, where their families are. What's going to happen to them when they become adults? And so it's so very important by our calendars, by our calendars and with our time, we are, we, are encouraging, we are encouraging our kids with this thought, this is the most important thing in your life. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Can I put that in modern day terminology? What does it profit your family? What does it profit your kids if they get a tremendous college scholarship, but they're not followers of Jesus Christ? What does it profit your child if they're a good enough athlete that they're able to pursue their career in athletics, but they are not a follower of Jesus Christ? Here's our command from the very beginning. You reflect my image. We are image bearers of Jesus Christ. We see that in the cultural mandate. In a very real sense, it's not just the cultural mandate, but it is the spiritual mandate. Here's another example of how that plays out. Um, one of our men, I won't tell his name because he didn't give me the freedom to tell his name. One of our men, before we began this series, Your Work Matters, began calling me. The timing was perfect. He began calling me saying, Brian, I hate my job. Brian, my boss is driving me crazy. Brian, I'm not sure I can do this job 
anymore. Has a good job, supervisor in a place, great job, great pay, all of that. But it was literally driving him crazy. And so I kept telling him, I won't say his name, I kept telling him, listen, hold on. We're going to talk about that soon. We're going to talk about that soon. Well, this sermon series has done a complete about face in this gentleman's life. Matter of fact, he called me this week and he says, Brian, God has specifically spoken to me through this. He said, I understand that where I am is where God wants me to be and that God is using me there. And I want you to know, Brian, I'm happy where God has placed me because I realize I'm where God wants me to be. And I'm like, praise the Lord, what a great story. He said, but Brian, that's not the end of it. I said, what else? He said, Thursday this week, one of my coworkers came in my office and said, man, what's, what's different about you? And he said, I was able there with my coworker to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in my office, my coworker surrendered his life to Christ. He said, Brian, that's why God has me there. Listen, here's what we want you to catch. Wherever God has you, wherever your garden is, wherever that is, God has placed you there for a purpose. And you're there for the purpose of reflecting his image and for the purpose of making a difference. The second command is found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. I kind of want to park here for just a few moments because this is an extremely convicting passage of Scripture. In in Matthew chapter 22, the the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus. If you're familiar with the New Testament, you know that that happened occasionally, that they were trying to trap him in his words. They were trying to catch him to to say something that he wasn't supposed to say. So here in Matthew chapter 22, they're trying their best to trip him up so that he would say something that they would deem inappropriate. And so in front of the crowd, they say, Master, 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 we have a question for you. Which law is the greatest? Or which commandment is the greatest? Now, they had the utmost extreme uh, our respect for Moses, and, and they were convinced that Jesus was going to say something that would disrespect Moses. And in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus gives them an unbelievable answer that I want you and I to see because it is right where we are living today. So notice this, Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 37, Jesus says this. This is his answer to the question, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. Now you think, I think I've read that somewhere else. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's called the Shema. It's what Moses had instructed the nation of Israel, that they should love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind, with all their being. Notice the next verse, verses 39 and 40, and he says, and the second is like it. You should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus tells them to do two things. And I want you to kind of let this sink in your mind and heart today. The first thing he tells them, he says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What does that mean? Now, later on, one of the translations say, with all of your might as well. What does that mean? Here's what it means to simplify it. There's some people that sit back and say, well, man, he's trying to say, okay, with your heart, I'm supposed to love him one way. With my mind, I'm supposed to love him another way. And, and with my being, another way. No, no, no. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that we are supposed to love him with every single part of us. Every ounce of our being should love Jesus Christ. But I think he also makes a second statement there. That we are to love the Lord our God more than anyone or more than anything. So, so can I ask you a question today and just let it bounce around in your head and let it bounce around in your heart this morning? Is there anything in your life, is there anyone in your life that you love more than Jesus 
Christ? That's a, that's a great reflective question. But the second thing he says, even if we do well on that, so you and I might sit back and say, okay, I think I test positively on that one. The second part, he says this, love your neighbor as yourself. I asked the question this week, why yourself? Why doesn't he say love your neighbor as you love your wife? Or love your neighbor as you love your husband. Or love your neighbor as you love your favorite football team. <laughs> love your neighbor like you love the Miami Hurricanes. Or, or love your neighbor like you love uh, this thing in your life. But he says, no, love your neighbor as yourself. Why is that? Because quite frankly, if we're honest with ourselves, there's no one in our life that we love more than ourselves. I love my wife dearly, but quite frankly, I think I love myself more than I love my wife. I love my grandkids immensely, but I think I love myself more than I love my grandkids. And I illustrate that on a regular basis, and you do too, because when you're hungry, what do you do? You feed yourself. When you're thirsty, what do you do? You give yourself something to drink. When you're sick, what do you do? You, you, you take medicine. You go to the doctor. Here's what, here's what Jesus is saying. When you have that same desire to minister, to take care of others, like you take care of yourself, then you're truly demonstrating the love of God. James says it this way, and I'm going to go somewhere in just a second with this, so follow me. James chapter 2 says this, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things that they need, the things that are good for the body, what good is that? Let me just say it how we say it sometimes. We find somebody who has a need and we look at them and say, I'm praying for you. <laughs> I want you to know I'm praying for you. When we have the wherewithal to help them, we don't help them, but we speak in spiritual platitudes and we tell them that we are going to pray for them. James says, how good is that? <laughs> what does that really help them? Luke chapter 10 records Jesus making the same statement to a group of religious leaders. And the religious leader trying to justify himself. The Lord said this, the greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your mind. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And this religious man trying to justify himself asked the question, but who's my neighbor anyways? I mean, it's so hard to define, is it not? Who is my neighbor? I come in contact with so many people. Who is my neighbor? Who should I love as myself. A couple of weeks ago, I was convicted with, with this thought. I'll tell you the story. I was at a Church United meeting, and so uh, we get together with area pastors, and I was at Church United meeting, and I was down at the front table with some of the some of the leaders, some of my friends, and a guy comes and sits down at our table. I had no idea who this guy was, and so we kind of shook hands and spoke for just a moment. And after a few moments, Eddie Copeland, the director, stands up and says, okay, I want to introduce our guest speaker today. Our guest speaker is Dave Runyon. He's a prolific author. Let's give Dave a warm round of applause. And the guy that I was sitting right beside who I had met was the speaker. And so David stood up, and I'm thinking, well, how cool is this? This is, this is the speaker. This is a renowned author. I just met him and had a conversation with him. And, and Dave, Dave has written a book called The Art of Neighboring. And Dave asked a question that I must confess to you thoroughly convicted me. Because he asked this question. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, what if he really meant your actual neighbors. <laughs> Boom. Think about that. What, what did Jesus say when he said, love your neighbor as yourself? He actually meant the person who lives next door to you. And he actually meant the person who lives across the street from you. And he actually meant the people who live on your street, or in your cul-de-sac, or in your association. I have to confess, can I be transparent? Vicki and I lived in our house for 13 years. 
I haven't been the best neighbor, and I've always used the excuse. I've always used the excuse, well, our church is in Hollywood. When we live in Pembroke Pines. And I sit back and think, even if I invited them, they're not going to come to Hollywood Community Church anyways. And so it's better for me to find neighbors around here where I can make them my neighbor and love them rather than, I would never say this, rather than wasting my time on the people who live next door to me. Now, now, I know Junior who lives across the street, and I know Dave who lives across the street. I know them, but I've actually really never gotten to know them. And Dave made the question, what if, what if Jesus meant love your neighbor as yourself? He meant the people who live right beside you and the people who live across the street from you. Can we do an exercise today? Would you do me a favor? Would you flip your outline over for just a second? Flip your outline over. I'm going to put a diagram up on the screen. Make, make a tic-tac-toe board, all right? Make a tic-tac-toe board on the back of your paper. Would you do that with me today? Make a tic-tac-toe board on the back of your paper. In the center the center of the tic-tac, now listen, don't start playing tic-tac-toe with the person beside you. That's not what we're doing, okay? All right, so the center is your house right there. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take just a second and write the names of the people who live around you. Can you do that? Take just a second. Write the names of the people who live across the street from you, beside you, behind you. Take just a moment and write their names, okay? Let's just pause for a second. Dun, 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 Okay, all right. So let me ask you this. How many of you knew all of your neighbors? Lift your hand. You knew all of your neighbors, every one of them. All right, that's about five hands in an auditorium of 350 to 400 people. How many of you knew half of your neighbors? Half of your neighbors. That's about another 20 or 30 right there. Listen, I'm not going to go any further because I don't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> Listen, I could only do three. All right, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor who has a burden for the people who live next to me. I could only write three of their names down. And Dave said this question, how can you ever expect to reach your neighbors with the gospel if you don't even know their names? If you've never taken the time to walk across the street and say, how you doing? My name's Brian. What's your name? Mike Rioiano. Nice to meet you. Huh? If Mike was my neighbor, I'd be a happy man. That's for sure. <laughs> Dave said, it's going to be a little uncomfortable because you're going to have to admit to your neighbor that you've lived beside him for a long time and you don't know their name. But what if we started building relationships this way? You see... I'm convinced that as pastors, we've erred. As pastors, we've sat back and we've challenged you. Share the gospel with somebody. And we walk out the door wondering, okay, who am I supposed to share the gospel with? All right, because in our neighborhood, we're so busy. Our schedule's busy. We pull in the driveway. We probably pull in our garage, shut the garage door, and we stay inside. We don't cook out very often. And the only time we really meet our neighbors is after a hurricane, right? Right? I mean, quite frankly, that's where I met Gary, who's behind me after a hurricane. And Gary and I, you know, during that week a few years ago, not last year, but the, the hurricane before, man, for a week, we became really good friends. But I don't even know Gary's wife's name. Vicki, what's Gary's wife's name? Jennifer. There you go. My wife knows better than I do. Jennifer. What if when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he meant your actual? I was so convicted by that. So convicted. Remember, you said, Brian, what does this have to do with, 
with this series, Your Work Matters. Remember a few weeks ago, we asked you to take your hand and we talked about the five areas of your life, yourself, your family, your job, your church, and your community. And I think as believers that we have isolated ourselves so much from our community that we're not able to make a difference there. And we pray for people to come to Christ. We pray for our church to grow. We pray for people to walk through the waters of our baptismal pool. And our neighbors are right across the street. And we haven't taken the time to meet them and to love them and to love them like we love ourselves. Our image bearing, our difference making, our loving our neighbor role begins with our actual neighbors. As I said, you can't love them till you know them. You can't tell your neighbor about Jesus till they tell you about themselves. There's a final command that I want you to see. It's in Matthew chapter 28. You're familiar with it. Probably the command that we're most familiar with. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. We've preached about this often. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. The command, if you look at the Greek structure of the verb, the command there is not go. We've said it's go. I've preached missionary messages for years, and I've said, boy, the most important thing in that verse is go. You need to go. So you need to go to another field. The most important verb in that passage is not go. It's not, it's not teach. It's not baptize, and we just baptize today. Those are the, not the most important commands in that verse. The most important command is to make disciples. Make disciples. And, and I believe, and this isn't the criticism of any other church other than ours, I think in our 21st century world, we've kind of lost Focus, because we've come to think that making disciples means to fill buildings. And so we just want to do as much as we can to fill buildings. And the command was never to fill buildings. If anybody could have filled a building, it would have been Jesus, would it not? But Jesus' command was to what? It was to make disciples. It was to make followers of Jesus Christ I've defined the disciple as a person who are willing to abandon who they are and what they hope to be in order to follow Jesus. And that's based upon his, his, uh, his experience with the disciples because when he came to the disciples, he looked at them, Peter, James, and John, and he said, follow me. And when they followed him, they did what? They left their nets. They left everything and they followed Jesus. So, so our challenge as a church, our challenge as a leadership is to raise up a group of Christ followers who are not just Sunday attenders, but they are people who are ardent, faithful, passionate disciples of Jesus Christ. That only happens when we invest our time and when we invest our energy into the life of people. How do we make disciples? Catch this church. I believe this. How do we make disciples? By loving our neighbors. By loving those with whom we work. By loving our family members. This might be the most important statement that I make all day long. I believe with all of my heart that the great commandment is the key to the great commission. Catch that, church. The great commandment is the key to the great commission. How does the world view believers? Think with me for just a second. How does the world, and when I talk about the world, I talk about the unbelieving world, people who, who don't claim to be followers of Christ. I have conversations with them on a regular basis, and it, it hurts my heart when I hear statements like, Christians are mean. Christians are unloving. 
Christians can't get along with themselves. Why would I want to be a part of a group like that? Jesus defined it when Jesus said this, this is how the world will know that you are my disciples. Remind me, what does he say? By what? By loving one another. So I believe with all of my heart that the great commandment is the key to the great commission. The more we love, the more disciples we will make. The more we treat others like we treat ourselves, the more willing they'll be to hear the message. The more we treat them like Jesus treated us, the greater impact we will have on our community. Listen, I, I, I got to be honest, I've struggled pulling these three together and we've talked all week long and Ramon is preaching in Spanish. I just talked to him. I said, Ramon, how, how are you pulling these things together? He said, it's been rough. So here's the message today. Not the most eloquent, but, but the message is this. Throughout scripture, God's given us the same command. It's found in Genesis chapter 1. It's found in Matthew chapter 22. It's found in Matthew chapter 28. And the command is this, that you were created for the purpose of bearing, reflecting the image of Jesus Christ, representing him, using what God has given you for the benefit of the world around you. What would happen if we learned our role? Our, our walkaway point very simply is this. To achieve the goal, you got to know your role. To achieve the goal, I have to know my role. And my role is this. I'm an image bearer of Jesus Christ who has been called to love others and reflect, reflect the glory of God in the world in which we live. So, so I'm going to give you some homework, and then our praise team is going to come up, all right? So here's the homework. I'm going to give you three things that are homework, all right? All right? Meet your neighbors, all right? Meet your neighbors. I would love to hear stories from some of you who took the initiative when you went home and said, man, I've lived next door to this person for so many years, and I've never actually met them, and I actually walked across the street and met them. Meet your neighbors. The second thing is this. Pray for your neighbors. I hope you have a prayer list. I'm not sure if you have a prayer list, but what if you began praying every single day for the people who live to your right, the people who lived in front of you, the people who live to your left, and the people who live behind you? And every single day, you began praying, God, help me to be a blessing to them. God, help me to love them. God, help me to reflect Jesus Christ to them. Help me to bear your image to them. Help me to love my neighbors as you loved me. And then the third thing is this. Look for a way this week to be a blessing to one of your neighbors. Just out of the way, completely unexpected, look for a way to be a blessing to your neighbors. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. God is going to give you divine appointments. And God's going to give me divine appointments. This is homework for me too. God's going to give us divine appointments where we can minister to those in our community. I'm convinced the only way that we're going to reach Hollywood for Christ is if you focus on your street and I focus on my street and we all together make a commitment saying we're going to love our community to Jesus Christ. GC3, God's command three times, cultural mandate, bear my image, make a difference. The great commandment, love God and neighbor. The great commission, make disciples. That's our role. Let's do it, church. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Lord, I know it's hot in here today. Lord, I know to a certain degree we've repeated things that we've said already here. But Lord, I pray that you would remind us, God, God you have this, 
this cosmic, spiritual, eternal purpose for each and every one of us. Help us to look beyond the, uh, the routine. Help us to look beyond the bills that we have to pay. Help us to look beyond the busyness of our schedule. Help us to realize that you placed us in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our jobs, in our schools, in our communities for the purpose of being image bearers of Jesus Christ. Help us to do that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.